Ruta Fris is Emeritus Professor of Developmental Cognitive Psychology at University College London. Chris Fris is also Emeritus Professor of Neuropsychology at UCL. They both are visiting professor at Aarhus University and members of the British Academy and the Royal Society. The two researchers are comrades in work but also in life as they have been married for 50 years. In 2014, they received the Jean Nicot Prize for which they came to Paris to give the four Jean Nicot lectures on what makes us social at the Département d'études cognitives of the École Normale Supérieure. This prize is a reward for all their work on social cognition. As both researchers fascinated by the human social capacities and handicaps have devoted a large part of their research work to study pathology marked by a profound social failure. Chris, with his long-lasting interest in schizophrenia and the implicit and explicit mechanism involved in social cognition, and Uta, with a large part of her career devoted to the study of autism from a cognitive point of view, of which she's one of the pioneers. The 2014 Jean Nico Prize and Lecture provided inspiration and founding for a new project, a scientific graphic novel named Two Heads, where two neuroscientists explore how our brain works with other brains. In this book, written with their author son Alex Friss and illustrated by the artist and graphic novelist Daniel Locke, the charming cartoon couple of researchers takes us on an ingenious and fascinating journey through their lives, their work and their colleagues, friends and students. In a burlesque and colorful universe where their two heads open up on demand to allow us to explore the wonders and mystery of the human brain. While in Paris, Uta and Chris visited us to the ENS to talk with us about this graphic novel created thanks to the prize they received at the same place eight years ago. Hello Uta, hello Chris and uh, welcome to the Département d'études cognitives of the École Normale Supérieure. And thank you for taking the time to speak with us uh, during your visit to Paris and to uh, talk to us about your new publication which is uh, something one might not uh, <laughs> expect from researchers because it's not a book, it's not a scientific publication, but it's a comic book, so yeah. um, a graphic novel and a really rich one for, of more than over 30, uh, 300 pages. So, so first, can, can you uh, present your comic book and uh, explain what is it about? Yes, we do want to say it's a serious science book. Yeah. But at the same time, it is, of course, a fun yeah. book to read, a comic for grown-ups. And we hope that that is actually something quite new that people can enjoy as well as, as learn, because we are doing a, a real deep dive into the history of neuroscience. Mm -hmm. We really talk about the difficulties that we encounter in studying uh, the brain and the mind. Uh, we uh, talk about um, recent difficulties that uh, psychologists have had in replicating studies. These are very yes. important issues in uh, the understanding of science. What can we believe, what can we trust, and mm. wh what, is, what is important um, for us. So we, we do try and clear up some misperceptions of psychology, and particularly, of course, um, as you would probably say, the book is about how we interact with other people and are embedded in other people mm. in culture. Yes, I mean, one of our main interests is to show how all cognitive processes mm. have a role in social interactions. And um, we show that even simple things like learning about the world, actually we mostly learn from other people. And it's, we don't need to make our own mistakes because other people have made them for us. We talk about how we can manage our reputation, which is very important for interacting with others. We talk about how we make inferences about what other people are thinking, sometimes called theory of mind. And, and two heads, it's and Yes, and in particular, yes, the two heads story. Yeah, the title. And in a sense, the theme of the novel, of the book throughout, is that the two of us are working together. And one of the sorts of experiments we talk about is those showing that actually when two people work together they can do better than one person working on their own. Yeah. And we're particularly interested in when this happens and when it doesn't happen and what we need to do to enable 
two heads to be better than one. <coughs> okay, thank you. So I was wondering how the, the idea of making this uh, graphic novel come about, because you came to, yeah. uh, to present the Jean Nicot lecture yes. in 2014. And so how did those lectures fed this project uh, of a it, graphic it novel? It really started there. Absolutely right. It started in Paris. It was the kind of simulation that we had about especially walking through Rue Dante, where we find all those wonderful bookshops okay. that we visited on our way back from the lectures. And um, we, we went to these uh, comic bookshops because we like them. And we have a son who is a um, particular fan of comics. I think we, we very much uh, looked when we could find something that's of interest to him and we could give him as a gift. And then the idea somehow crystallized that wouldn't it be nice instead of just writing the academic mm -hmm. book, which of course we would write, we did. We Very did write. boring academic But <laughs> it's, it's a different different matter to try and communicate in a, in a new way. And it very much depended, of course, on being able to recruit our son to be the one to actually do it. Um, so it's Al uh, Alex uh, yes. first? Yes. Okay. One of the author of the Yes, he, he has... Uh, uh, turned out to be, uh, in fact, the author. He is the real author. author. <laughs> um, okay. We are very much um, acting as the script writers or content providers. And of course, we had to find um, an illustrator, which was uh, not so easy. So we did actually a little competition to okay. see um, which one we would, we would like best and be able to work with best. And it's, it's very much um, an example of um, collaboration, not only two, of course. We had four heads together. Yeah. And we, uh, we took five years over all this. Okay. It was a, I mean, doing a graphic novel, we discovered, is a, is a bit more like making a film. Uh, yes. So our okay. son Alex was the director and did the storyboard, and Daniel Locke is the cameraman. And you we were the actors? Yeah, and we were sort of, we thought we were the <laughs> script writers, but, but we're actually, actually, we're actually we just characters. characters. <laughs> okay, but it, it wasn't just them. We, there was also, uh, Daniel Locke's wife did the colouring. Okay. And somebody else came in to do the shape of the speech bubbles. Oh, so so it really much more a, than four heads, in the, fact. It's more yeah. than four heads in the end. So it was, a, yeah. it was a wonderful collaboration. But one of the other things that inspired us is there's a, a particularly successful graphic novel called Logic Comics, yeah. which is um, extraordinary because it tells in this graphic form the history of logic and philosophy at the turn of the 20th century. Yes. But again, as seems to happen with all these graphic books, it's built around a person. So this is built around the life of Bertrand Russell. But yes. it's actually trying to explain, you know, the philosophy of Wittgenstein, Gödel's proof, and all sorts of very difficult concepts, but in this graphic form. So we thought we could do that. And so you were talking about the academic book that you are writing also, um, that, uh, that is from the Jean Nicot lectures. Yes. yes. And so each, uh, each time with the Jean Nicot Prize, the awardee um, has to publish uh, this yeah. book at MIT Press. Yes. And so uh, how much the content of this academic books overlaps with the content of the, this graphic novel? That you Quite know. a lot, but it's much, much more in-depth and much, much okay. more extensive. Mm -hmm. um, this is quite a big book, if you think about yes. it, as, as comics go. But, it but it, there are many things that are really left out that, that we couldn't uh, cover. It would have just become yeah. excessively long. Yes, and we didn't put any mathematical formulae in here. But the <laughs> MIT <laughs> Press book it does, and it has footnotes, and it has really, really massive numbers of references. But oh, one of, of the new things uh, for a comic, we think, is that this one has references at the back. Yes, which is and footnotes also. And right. footnotes yeah. also, yeah, that's true. So um, we, we, we very much like the idea that the, the evidence for many of yes. the slightly light-hearted things that are expressed in the comic. Now, once you've bought this book, <laughs> You then have to buy the MIT book as well. Exactly, to <laughs> complement <laughs> your uh, knowledge. <laughs> to, to <go laughs> Maybe it's not the same public. <laughs> but no, but if you want to check out whether yeah. you can rely, whether you can trust the science that's presented here, yeah, you this will is get the backup. 
And that's what we really wanted to do. We wanted mm. to make clear that you do need a lot of evidence. Yeah. And you do need to consider these uh, very frequent failures of replication and what they might mean. Yeah, you talk ab uh, about it a lot in your book, and this yeah. is really interesting because sometimes when we when we read some uh, comic books about science, it's always about the results and yeah. not yeah. Uh, about the the way the results were made and uh, yes. the difficulty of making good science. Yes, and yes. Nice. I, I guess that's one of the themes of the book is trying to explain yeah. how science works, what people what people actually do. Mm -hmm. That's why why yeah. we are the the, the characters who. Mm -hmm. uh, present maybe also the frustrations or the difficulties. Yeah. But we also try and show cartoons of the people who actually did the experiments. Yes, yeah. these cartoons of real yeah. people. Uh, in yeah. The yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was also wondering um, if maybe uh, the, the fact of making this graphic novel uh, brings something to you uh, personally and maybe uh, also to your research work. Like having to uh, rethink your work in another way or with another angle. Well, Maybe for me, it's it's very much um, about science communication. I have been very concerned with um, often very sort of hyped presentations of of experimental results mm. and simplifications that are just not supportable. And um, it seemed that, that I gained a, a di an, an insight into how one could really do that in a, in a yeah. form that's much more accessible and that uh, tells you about uh, the possibility, you know, having a simple picture and saying something and then, you know, unraveling it a bit. So that to me has been uh, important. I mean, I think science communication is something that we really need to still work on. Um, it, it's, it's not something that, that uh, you, you do take for granted will, will always work. You can do the research and even for other researchers to mm. know about it, you have to communicate it appropriately, but even more so for the general public. But I mean, one of the good things about the collaboration, of course, is that Alex and Daniel, that is the director and the cameraman, don't know anything about this topic. Yes. So we had to explain it to them. It was the first step, uh, and, and yeah. that, that that was qu quite a revelation yeah. to some extent. We were quite surprised sometimes that it wouldn't. wouldn't the bits get that they didn't get, and the bits that they did get, yeah. were yeah. not yeah. what you would expect. Yeah. And the other thing that struck me is, of course, there's this extraordinary difference between when we give talks. If we give talks, they're all PowerPoint or keynote or mm -hmm. something. So there's pictures all the time, and you base your what you say on the pictures yeah. that you're looking at on the screen. But when you write a paper or re even write a book, there are very few pictures, and for example, you're not allowed to have colour by most publishers. Yes. And so, so we were thinking, why, why, don't, why can't we write a book which is full of pictures? Because that's how we present it. Yeah, this is actually, this was my, one of my questions, like what do you think about graphic novels as a way to communicate science? And, uh, and did you maybe, with, uh, did you, while writing the book, uh, find that with some anecdotes in particular or some concept, the drawing were particularly efficient mm -hmm. to yeah. add uh, yeah. some... Uh, I, th I think there is, there is an example, to me at least, that mm. is the example um, from one of the earliest comics that I know of in, in 1850. Um, the the uh, German writer and illustrator Wilhelm Busch mm -hmm wrote a story about mm, some naughty boys, Max and Moritz, very well known to, to German children and also to our children. <laughs> and uh, this, th he gave rise to countless comics about mm. naughty boys, you know, like the, the Peanuts or Crazy Cat or you know, many other such comics. But one page sort of stuck in my mind, one panel of one of his stories and this, by uh, extraordinary coincidence, was the same panel that inspired um, Heinz Swimmer and Josef Perner to okay. develop a test for this idea of theory of mind, attributing mental yeah. states to other people, which is no, sort in of... In, in English, at least, is the Sally Ann test. Okay. But it's so really a Max and the Chocolate test. Yeah, yeah. it's Max and Moritz. <laughs> and it comes from the Max and Moritz panel, oh. which shows everything in one 
uh, it, it really explains that when you look at a picture, this image, you automatically have to understand what's in the mind of the naughty boys, what's in the mind of the um, woman who is being, being tricked. tricked, what's in the mind of the dog of the woman <laughs> <laughs> included. Which we will show you in a minute. Yes. All of this for the reader is actually effortless to do and combine together mm -hmm. and, and to laugh about it. The, the really interesting thing is that this is a very humorous yeah. story. So I think it, it is an example of how um, a, a comic may well have inspired um, a very important uh, cognitive theory in producing a particular uh, technique for testing it mm -hmm. and also uh, possibly for um, understanding it better what actually is going on uh, when we um, read stories or look at uh, cartoons to, um, to understand possibilities that different people have different ideas in their heads and having them all together mm. is often extremely yeah. contradictory and, and very funny. And isn't this mostly what real novels are actually about? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, do, do you have maybe uh, one anecdote or psychologi psychological concept or maybe a study that you particularly like uh, in yeah. your book? Yeah. Yes, the one, the one I was... Yes, the do I was... We, we talk about reputation management yeah. and so for example you give more money to charity if people are watching you that's sort of well known what i didn't know and was fascinating the same thing happens in fish okay <laughs> so these cleaner rats which clean the bigger fish they clean better if there are other big fish watching them <laughs> and they do various tricks to try and regain their reputation if they're lost if they've lost it so, w and I guess the message is, I don't think the fish are doing it the same way as we do it, but it shows that the reputation is a very important thing that's going to evolve in all sorts of different levels. So that was my favorite. Yeah, and, and, and I was very impressed by the studies, again, I didn't know them before, of um, the importance of gossip. You know, we always think of gossip as a, a bad thing. You know, we, mm. we sort of used to saying, oh no, I don't want anything to do with gossip. I want to use my own observations. Um, you know, not what I get from, from uh, unreliable other people. Well, numerous experiments have shown that we're far more likely to trust what we hear about other people than we trust our own observations. And it's completely rational to do this because our own observation is, is just a one-off very often. We don't have the time. Uh, to you know, to interact with the person for a very you know in intense way to know whether we can cooperate with them, whether they are going to deceive us or not, but we can rely to some extent on the the voices in a, around us who have had their own experience, all different experiences, with that person, and they've mm. heard things about them from other people. So it's those things that actually really matter when you have a, a setup, for example, an economic game where you have a, a trust game. You can invest money in the other person in the hope of getting some money back. Now, if you heard something about that person, just a little bit negative, you will be less trusting. Even though during the few trials of the game, that person is completely trustworthy, you won't even take that into account. So I found that very interesting. And you can even see that in the brain. So if, if, if you, were, you were measuring people's brain activity while they're playing the trust game, if normally, if the person they're playing with is trustworthy or untrustworthy, you see lots of activity. If they've been told in advance this person is trustworthy, the brain is no longer responding to these unexpected events. So it's as if the whole thing has been weighted down. You put much more weight on what other people tell you. Okay, really interesting. Thank you. Um, so I was also wondering what does working so with two heads bring to you? And also, r is really working with two or more heads more efficient or always better than working with ah. only one head? Ah, it's much more complicated, yes. <laughs> yeah. Much more complicated. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I guess there are 
there are several things that have to happen for it to actually work. Yeah. But that, it, the, it's mostly covered by the word alignment. So the two people or the more than two people have to be aligned. But this is in all sorts of ways. So for example, they all have to have the same goal. But they also have to be aligned, and they also have to have roughly the same abilities. So, for example, their experience showing if you're working with one other person who's much less able than you, this may pull the pair down. But if they're both roughly equal, then they can do better than each one on their own. And this is partly due to you have to be aligned in the way you talk about the results. So one of the ways this works is confidence. So, for example, on a trial-by-trial -trial basis, you you have to make a decision, what was the right answer? And you can tell each other, you say, I am pretty confident this is the right answer, and the other person says, I'm not so confident. So you choose the answer of the more confident person. But obviously, this only works if you're using the same language to talk about confidence. Mm. Or if um, one person is persistently more confident than the other, that may, it may pull you down. And what is fascinating is these results showing that we seem automatically to adjust the way we talk about confidence because of the way our partner talks about confidence. So if you have a un less confident and a more confident person on their own, when they work together, the less confident person ups it and the le more confident person downs it. So another example of alignment, alignment. but yeah. at a different okay. level. You can have alignment, of course, in, in herds of animals, for example, that they go in the same direction. But and that, yes. people go in the same Yes, but um, that also works. So the reason that, say, uh, a shoal of fish can follow a very small scent to go in the right direction is because they all have a very small, on their own, they wouldn't, have, wouldn't be sufficiently accurate. But they, because they're all together and they align the direction they swim in, that actually enhances the signal. They can average out the, they the average noise. Out the noise. I was also wondering if maybe there are, um, with your two different heads, maybe sometimes you disagree or there are some scientific issues where you are yeah. not totally in Well, one alliance. of the themes in the book, of course, is, is differences and di diversity. We yeah. actually really believe that when groups of people work together, they benefit from diverse skills and expertise and different mm. ideas and indeed different uh, backgrounds. And I think we, we, we do uh, get new ideas and, and, and different input when we, when we listen to, to these differences. When we are too, too aligned, it, it is very often a kind of, we, we, we get into a, a local minimum. We can't really see the, the bigger picture mm -hmm. or other possible solutions. So in our case, we have a few sort of pet differences, don't we? Um, one, one we, we cultivate a difference that uh, it's, it's about, you know, nature nurture a debate where we, we all know it. She it thinks it's all nature. Yes, <laughs> but we, we all know that there is interaction all the time. It isn't like one and all the other. Mm -hmm. But I'm sort of always speaking up for nature and for evolution and for a sort of biological uh, it's basis. It's all culture. And Chris is, is very much speaking up okay. for culture and the environment. So these, these, there are lots of differences that arise from that mm. as well. But we, it's, it's slightly not, not entirely serious. Yes, but really. even, it's very serious. But <laughs> anyway, the, I mean, slightly related to that is the, is the idea of what is, the ba what is human nature at its base? Mm. And there's one idea that we're basically competitive, um, what would you say, selfish, and we have to use our high level um, you know, controls, controls and, and, and to stop mission. us being that's, selfish. That's, a, a, a very that's one version. And the other theory. version, which I believe yeah. in, is that we're actually at heart altruistic. And in fact, we use these high level, or politicians in particular, use the high level control things for saying you shouldn't be altruistic. These people are evil and you should get rid of them sort of thing. So that, that there's a yeah. slight argument there. So I think we're basically altruistic, but this is sometimes perverted. Yeah. So I, I like the idea, of course, that we are basically altruistic, but, but I'm, con I'm constantly reminding Chris <laughs> and saying, you know, but why then do we have all these wars? What's going on there? And of course, one of the big um, chapters in this book and yeah. certainly in the MIT book is the tendency to form in groups and out groups, which seems to be absolutely baked into us um, and indeed other animals too mm. as far as we can see when, that, when that's been tried and it seems 
a clear advantage is there, but um, of course there are also very, very bad consequences that have to do with, um, you know, aggression and competition. We, we also have another theme, perhaps more in the MIT book. Well, I was going book. to say, yes, and this, was written, this was started a long time ago, but the MIT mm -hmm. book, a lot of the writing was in the, the, the beginning of this COVID okay. problem and the lockdown, and it struck us an enormous amount of altruism emerged at the beginning of the lockdown with people helping each other, people yeah. wanting to interact. We, I we can't remember, you know, the quite, quite number of people using Zoom went up by a million or something. Yeah. 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 And people were offering, you know, to, to do shopping for their neighbours and, 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 and quite spontaneously. And that was very sort of heartwarming. Your, your comic book is, uh, while being really rich uh, in the content and uh, really serious, is also extremely colorful and joyful and often really, really funny. And so it talks to a really wide public and even the youngest, because uh, uh, we know someone here that, who is named Tristan, which is a, who is a nine-year-old boy, and who read your book from beginning to end and uh, who have some questions for you. Oh, that's going to be great. <laughs> this book because it has the right balance between information and fun. Good. To start with, I would like to know if what you describe is true for the children's brain or only for the ones of adults. Also, what do you think is missing in this book? Will there be a sequel? Ah, oh, how nice. Oh, what <laughs> lovely questions. Absolutely marvellous. That is... And those are good questions. Yes. Absolutely brilliant. Um, so what is, is it true for children's brains? Most of what we say in the book is true for children's brains, but children's brains, just like children's bodies, are not completely mature. And there are things that happen in the brain, certainly throughout childhood and probably even up to 20s, where the brain is maturing. And there are some things that very young children certainly can't do and older children will be able to do and a few things that older children can't do but adults can do or at least can do better. But so in that sense, there are differences. But most of what we talk about in this book would apply to children as well. We do occasionally um, ask the question, what happens with, the, when does this yeah. all start? Yeah. What happens with young babies? But we don't do it systematically, I think. So that, that is possibly a reason for another book that actually really looks at the changes that happen over a lifetime. We could even add the question, what happens when you get older? Yes. You get yes. old like us. What do we lose? Or is yes. there something that we... Because it used, it used to be believed that the brain stopped developing at 16 and thereafter that it was downhill and that neurons started dying off. We, we don't believe that anymore, and we think, yes. having reached the age of 80, that our prime is yet to come. <laughs> <laughs> but the other thing that, I think the other thing that's missing from this book is there's not enough maths. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And there should be a whole book about the computational, computational mechanisms. mechanisms yeah, that but we happens. don't yet know how to make that fun. Yeah, that's a, that's a tough a tough one. Yeah. So maybe a sequel about uh, competition. A sequel? I think the one that, that talks about development over, over a lifetime would be a, a very nice um, idea. I think that's uh, something to think about. Do you think a book was more about culture, about the different cultures and mm. how... That would be interesting too, yeah. because we only give just a very vague uh, examples about how we react to people mm. in different cultures. And there's a lot more that's relevant I mean, today. There's going to be a sort of sequel that will not involve us, because as we said, the book is basically written by our son Alex. Mm -mm. And he is now working on a book which will be much more about how science works. Which he, uh, he would interview, scientists. say, six different scientists in different disciplines, explaining how they do their work. Okay. And, would, and that because it's graphic, he's going to have a different illustrator for each section. Okay, thank you really much for your answers. I think uh, Tristan will be uh, delighted. Well, <laughs> no, thank very you good for his questions. questions. Yeah. Uh, really yeah. excellent. 
And thank you again for coming. And uh, I wish you a good uh, trip to Paris. Thank and you very enjoy much. the weather. Thank you very much for, for having us here. And That was and fun, yeah. <laughs> talking about this book. Thank you.